Thank you for joining me. I want to talk today about the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2001, and I'm just going to provide a general introduction, a kind of an overview look at the reasons why the Act was developed and passed, and what some of the general emphases are of the Act and what its implications are for business ethics. I will not be drilling down into the granular details of the different parts of the Act. That's a task for another venue, but I will be providing some guidelines for understanding what, it's in, what the law's intention is and what its ramifications are. So for starters, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, an Act dating to 2001, uh, was an enormous sweeping piece of federal securities legislation impacting not just uh, the publicly traded companies that this country, the United States, relies upon, but also impacting the various different auditors and regulators and governors and boards of directors that are involved in these publicly traded companies. It was developed as a result of some of the major scandals that preceded the 2000-2001 tech bubble and crash. And in particular, the two scandals that most everyone references are the Enron scandal and the WorldCom scandal. Both famous scandals where a large amount of fraudulent accounting was involved and many assets were claimed that were not actually on the books of the companies. At any rate, though, in the aftermath of those scandals, uh, the government decided that some new regulations that were much stricter were necessary in order to reinstill confidence in American business, in the American public. And let me say a quick thing about that. We live today in the 20th, 21st century in a world where there are large numbers of publicly traded companies and numerous people who are the owners of these companies, the shareholders, who know little to nothing about the companies themselves. Often if you own an ETF or a mutual fund, you're not even aware of what companies your uh, instrument is involved in or holds. And uh, for those who do know what their companies uh, do, the, the companies that they are shareholders of, Often they do not know anyone personally in the company. The members of the company are more or less strangers to them. And in a setting like this, where securities markets rely upon math and impersonal interactions among owners and fiduciaries, C-suite executives whose job is to do what the owners designate them to do, it is imperative that there be confidence in the efficacy of the system and in the trustworthiness of the counterparties on the other side of the system. So if I'm a shareholder in a large publicly traded company like Apple or Microsoft, um, I want to know for sure that I can trust the financial statements and the decision making and have confidence in the uh, integrity of the C-suite executive team that is in charge of these companies. At any rate, Sarbanes-Oxley uh, was a sweeping piece of federal legislation, impacted especially what are known as issuers, which are publicly traded companies that have to be of a certain size and have a certain number of employees. It included uh, provisions, uh, first of all, let me run through some of them, for uh, the establishment of a public company accounting oversight board, or a PCAOB. The PCAOB is a kind of a federal intrusion or, or step into the accounting profession. Prior to Sarbanes-Oxley, it was typical for the accounting profession to regulate itself. After Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, the government took a much more active role in ensuring that the auditors of public companies um, were themselves subject to substantial oversight. The government in the form of the PCAOB required auditors of public companies to jump through a large number of hoops. Hoops that ensured or, or at least formally ensured the integrity and trustworthiness of the public audit process. These hoops included such things as uh, 
with the government stipulating that auditors of public companies can't have uh, special relations with the uh, the C-suite executives of companies that can't have worked for the companies, they can't have family members who've worked for the companies that they're auditing. They can't have conflicts of interest. They can't be providing other kinds of non-auditing services at the same time that they are doing audit work uh, and so forth. All of these measures on the part of the government through the vehicle of the PCAOB, Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, were attempts to ensure that the auditing process could be trusted again in the United States. The major reason why the government instituted these regulations and established a whole new public uh, regulation system for the uh, effective maintenance of regulations of the accounting profession uh, had to do with the famous, infamous I suppose, accounting firm Arthur Anderson. Arthur Anderson was Enron's accounting firm and also the accounting firm for WorldCom. And in that capacity, it not only served as an auditing firm, the job, it, whose job was to assure the public, the investors and creditors, that Enron's balance sheets could be trusted. It also served as a, um, as a consulting firm, a company whose job was to provide the uh, client, Enron and WorldCom, with uh, insights into how they could make their operations more efficient. Because of that conflict of interest, it served both as a, an auditor and simultaneously as a consulting firm. It was both a referee and also a coach at the same time, to use a sports metaphor. Because of that conflict of interest, um, Arthur Anderson infamously overlooked intentionally, knowingly, overlooked the, uh, the irregularities and all the obfuscations on the balance sheets of these massive frauds in Run and WorldCom, and in the end it caused the collapse of Arthur Anderson as an accounting firm once its uh, lies and deceptions were discovered and once the public lost confidence in it. That was the backstory behind the establishment of the PCAOB. Another second uh, major part of Sarbanes-Oxley had to do with strengthening uh, statement certifications and also uh, securities fraud penalties for CEOs, CFOs, and other members of C-suite level executive teams. Uh, the CEO of Enron, Ken Lay, famously stood up at a press conference and said that Enron's finances had never been stronger than they were that day. And simultaneously that day as he did that, he also privately dumped his own personal shares in Enron. And in the aftermath of that notorious securities fraud, the government through the Sarbanes-Oxley legislation wanted to ensure that CEOs and CFOs could be held personally liable for the financial statements that they certified on behalf of the companies uh, for which they were fiduciary employees. Sarbanes-Oxley substantially increased securities fraud penalties. It substantially increased the punishments that the government could dole out for white collar crime in general, and especially white collar crime involving accounting fraud. Other aspects of Sarbanes-Oxley, a third aspect, major aspect that I want to highlight here is its uh, stipulations regarding board of directors and corporate governance. Sarbanes-Oxley attempted to ensure that corporate governance was uh, more fairly distributed across public companies so that it was no longer possible for individual rogue uh, CEOs or CFOs to uh, go on fraudulent uh, journeys and to bring down entire companies with them. The Board of Governance, uh, I'm sorry, the Board of Directors Governance stipulations that Sarbanes-Oxley uh, implemented were intended to ensure some degree of accountability across the various different companies that are publicly traded in the United States. And that also meant greater transparency in the financial statements that were provided to the public. The financial statements are the, uh, that companies issue are the lifeblood of the American uh, publicly traded uh, price discovery markets. In the absence of those financial statements, it is not possible for investors and potential creditors to evaluate the fiscal 
uh, efficacy and solvency of the companies that they intend to invest in. And Sarbanes-Oxley was intended as a law that would uh, greatly bolster, greatly strengthen the, uh, the requirements in financial reporting and the degree to which the members of boards of directors could be held accountable for the nature of that financial reporting. Finally, uh, one other thing that I want to highlight is the way that Sarbanes-Oxley uh, brought a, a sweeping new set of regulations upon all outside auditors to ensure the uh, integrity and trustworthiness of the process by means of which the accounting profession uh, earns its bread in its efforts to serve as a referee for the country's uh, price discovery securities markets. Uh, there are a variety of other aspects of Sarbanes-Oxley. It is a voluminous uh, law, uh, enormous in scope and in its uh, stipulations. These are just some of the main themes themes that it is important to remember as we encounter this important uh, and far-reaching piece of federal legislation.